I'm spirit. Everything has to do with three. The close of the teaching tonight, we'll go through that, uh, the imprint of the Godhead uh, on the universe, and I'll pass out these again. And you keep them somewhere because the very fact that you can just take something like this and show somebody lost, just say, look at this. After about three or four of them, they start to catch on. Wow, that's sort of weird, ain't it? That there's, I mean, even that, yeah, that's right. And, the, and that's anything that can trigger somebody to think about somebody's up there is a good thing. Now, last week I closed with uh, uh, our position in the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of you know that, and, you know, I'm going to preach and teach that until the cows come home a couple, three times a year. Uh, all of our preaching usually ends up that way uh, because we're either talking about uh, the salvation of souls, somebody dying and going to hell, or we're trying to encourage the believer to understand his position, you know, where it's at, and that's why he should be better down here. You know, that's the bottom line, really. I mean, we can make it real simple. But what people are forgetting is preaching has to have a direction, and it has to end with, uh, uh, end with the idea that the person in the pew must make a decision. Teaching, we're building upon and building upon and building upon. You can get your head grounded pretty good, but normally we don't try to make you do anything or hit the altar. Uh, there was a time when I taught to see the Christ people got saved. You know, that was... God's plan. I mean, I'll stop in the middle of anything if he's working. But uh, him, he's working now. But I'm saying if he starts manifesting, I'm, uh, I've learned enough now to just, mm -mm, I'm not intimidated at all if the Lord wanted to superimpose his will upon it right here. <laughs> you know. So, however, about the position we left off with this uh, this statement here. I said, our journey, our personal experience and the amount of belief we have in the amount of the Bible we know is another story in fulfilling the will of God or our will. You're either going to do your will or His will. It's the bottom line. And um, so we're going to stand at sort of like that, that frame, a little bit of thinking, uh, like we did earlier about the sin nature and and things that can take place in our life and things that we forget and we let, let slip. Um, we can get caught with later. Uh, I've had people uh, watch me, you know, in this church and remind me of something. I'd say right away, I, I didn't feel no connection or anything, like something was going to happen. But I thought about it. I said, that's the devil, man. See, the devil knows how to pick our pocket whenever he wants to. It's just an amazing thing. Without the Holy Spirit... Uh, protecting us, making us aware that something's coming on, how in the world are you going to stand against a supernatural being that had 6,000 years of expertise in dealing with us and our flesh? It's impossible without the Lord. So we have to claim the position that we're in whenever we get spiritual battles going on and understand that because of that position, we do have power. And, um, and on the other hand, remember that this flesh, this old person... Oh, buddy, I can just say this in my notes. I said, protection against anything evil as a Christian is the amount of belief he has in his position. In other words, proportional from what I'm gathering in my life. If I have little faith in a certain area, I don't really, yeah, I know it's in there. I know that's what they say, but I don't get it yet. That's usually when I get it. You know, I'm not talking about getting the truth. I'm talking about getting it in the back getting it some way, messing up, until I get it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know some people how some people do it, but... So we are what we are when we rest in the fact of Christ's redemption. Go to 1 John 5. Uh, what's aggravating me about this class? In my mind, I'm saying, okay, it's a liberal college. It is a university. I know what to expect. But then I have to... Go through and critique a book that's supposed to be my textbook, and I'm supposed to give a half a page, you know, three half pages, on what wows me. And then he says, or what you disagree with. And so from page one all the way through the book, I'm disagreeing. I'm just go, I'm getting an ulcer. And I looked and I said, Lord, no, can't, I ain't got enough time. There's not, a, not enough days in the year, man. Mm -mm, I am not writing a dissertation for a associate's degree. 
He's not going to do it. So I found out what I agreed with. And, uh, you know, I did that, you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that if you were in this college and it professes to be Christian and you know nothing about the Bible, you know nothing about Jesus, and you are sitting in this class and the first thing they flash is Greek. And then they go, you know, that, that means he knows. He'll underline some stuff, say a few words, you know. And, and then he'll make, make sure that you know he's got a Ph.D., then he'll sit down and start to talk. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then sometimes we'll have some good stuff. And I'll, you know, he's smiling. But other than that, if you leave that class in the direction it's going now, supposed to be a New Testament survey, you're going to be left with, wow, is that complicated? Who would ever figure this stuff out? I mean, all these people agree on this, but some don't agree on that. And then, you know, he agrees on this. That means i got to study all this. But just know there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, and the epistles, you know, and then give a little of what each book is. No, it's all argumentative. It's all critiquing. And when you're done with it, it's actually critiquing the scriptures. And so if you're a Bible believer, it will, it will, it just drive you crazy, you know, but... We're going to do the best we can. I just said that because what you're learning here today is I'm not going to ever try to, I mean, on purpose, bring doubt on the Scriptures. First John 5, look at verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God. Okay, we'll just, there's no punctuation there, but we'll just stop here for a minute. And if I ask you, if I look out at you, now all you profess, at least you have to me, that you're born of God. So everyone in here is born of God, right? But let's go on and finish the verse here. It says, for whatsoever is born of God, it says, overcometh the world. So what do you think that means? You're going to overcome it. Now, every time I look at that verse, I know when I'm going to overcome it. When's that, preacher? When I die. <laughs> I'll be over it. I'll be through it and on the other side, man. <laughs> anyway, no. <laughs> and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our what? Faith. So anytime the world is on you, you should be able to get over on it. And you don't get over on it because you have little faith. Make sense? Okay. That's the gist of the teaching. Now, go to James chapter 4. I went in my office today, and I was, just for kicks, I'm looking at my interlinear and my Greek helps, and I was just going to break down, you know, and uh, slabicate a verse, you know, just get it down or just, I mean, with just about five words, like a phrase, there are so many different meanings for each one of those words. Then you've got to go into tenses, and then in the tenses, it could still be taken. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying... I don't have a 200-something IQ like them translators did. All I got is the helps that these, these people with less smarts than them put together. And a lot of them were lost. When I can just go to a... Ver and when they're all done, guess what they come up with? What I already got. But they make you think that they're smart. So if I can just go to my old King James Bible, I can get a dictionary, I can go crazy. And if I don't want to use a dictionary, because a lot of times it's not right, you just use what you're supposed to use, the Bible itself. It's its own dictionary. And you'd come up with it. Holy Ghost would bless it. And you could go on without wasting your time and trying to critique. So James, somewhere around Hebrews, I know i got to go to the left here. Cop the left. Okay, James chapter 4. And it's a familiar chapter. I was talking to somebody today, and they kept taking me back to the first part of James. You know, it's written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, right? You know, and I'm Gentile, so apparently it don't belong to me. But anyway, I told them there's some things through tribulation saint in there. Sure enough is. Oh, yeah, they'd be running to and fro. Then I, then I started bringing things out. Okay, I'm not supposed to ask for wisdom. 
What I told him was this. If they're so hung up on Paul, then if James don't contradict Paul, go with it. How about that? Would that be okay? And the only reason I said that, you probably would never notice that in a thousand years, but some people are sticklers like that when they get into this chopping up so fine that they forget that all Scripture is given by inspiration, and God put that in there specifically to trap them up. And it's given for certain things. And so for practical living, I don't care if it's to a hook-nosed you or not. <laughs> anyway, James 4, 7. This is one of those, anyway. These are some things here. It says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, you don't have to use that if you don't want to, but I am. I just believe that will work. It says, Draw nigh to God, and he will what? And then what's amazing in these two verses, and everybody else preaches on a whole lot of things, but what I noticed was this. After these things, it says, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye what? Double-minded. That's something you got to do. But you can't do it until after you submit to him. You can't do it. Why? Because you're already being manipulated. Your heart, your emotions are already manipulating you. We're talking about spiritual warfare. And until I can honestly get over my gluttonous, I cannot preach this with the power that I need. Because there is some, some stuff in me. You know what I mean? It's just one of them things. It's hard. And maybe it helps me preaching because I have to be humble. But I know this, that the same spiritual conditions surround gluttony just as they do any other sensual sin. And most Baptists, we give in to that wholeheartedly. And then once we do it by habit, it's in control. That's just the way it is. And so every year I lose 40, gain back 40, maybe 50. You know, I go up and down, up and down. But while I'm losing, it's like I got some control. I get a little encouraged. And then something happens. I, just, I get apathetical, and who gives a rip? I'm going to die anyway, I'm going to heaven. You know, I don't know what God's going through. I don't know if I, if I got guardian angels, they better have supernatural lives. That's all I know. Because I've been put them through the test, amen? But when I look at this, I, I said all that because, you know, I don't know where you're at. What kills most Christians is not the outward sins, but it's the inward ones. The ones people can't see anyway. But uh, sometimes the, uh, the overweight is a result from things that are inside. The manifestation. You can even get that in psychology class, but it's already in the Bible before they even wrote them books. So James 4, 7... And, of course, the warfare of spirit-filled believers in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go to Ephesians 6. We're not gonna, I'm not going to try to comment on every verse, but we'll go to, we'll, we'll, I just want you to see these eight verses that you already know is in there. And I, there's books. There's, I mean, can I say plethora? Anyway, there's a, there's a mess of them. I got them in my library on this spirit-filled believer. Spiritual warfare. How to uh, put on the whole armor of God. Remember, Brother Jones, finally, after all those years writing all those books and everything, when he preached that one message, it was about the best one I ever heard. He says, you know, you put on the whole armor of God? Just put on Jesus Christ, stupid. And I thought about that for a while. It does say, put them on. Put the other one off. I mean, if you put them on, what else do you got to have? But anyway... This is going through because it covers doubts, right? Helm of salvation. It goes through and covers all these things and lets you know, you know, you need to be prayer warrior and stuff like this. Anyway, in verse 10, finally, my brethren, and plus it's in God's word. Paul's telling us this is very important. <laughs> finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. See that? And there's a period. See that? So we know that we have to be strong in the Lord, Right? And in the power of his might. So right there, those two things mean that your mind has to be thinking about your position, that you're in Christ. And number two, that you can, all, you can do all things through Christ. Right? That means it's going it's to mean you've you got to know your position, that you're in Christ. Then you've got to count on his power to help you do what you're supposed to do. 
Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles, methods. I mean, that verse is heavy. I just, every time I read this Bible, something else pops out. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Either against me or for me or makes me understand something more. But I mean, it's just, it's simple if you look at it. Understand your position. Understand you can't do anything without his power. Understand also that you have an enemy. His name's the devil. A lot of times we'll downplay it, say, oh, you, didn't, you can't even handle the flesh. Yet, yet you, ain't even, you ain't even worked up to the devil. We heard that before, right? But my Bible right here says, for on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's what it says. Is it was it just talking about Paul and the, the, the disciples there? Or everybody? So then we have to understand what the wiles of the devil, what's his methods? What does he use? Well, he's got minions. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, comma, against powers, comma, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm telling you people, Daniel took him 30 days to get a prayer answered. And we, a lot of people just go over that story like, well, that's Old Testament, this is new, and we got to... How do you know what's going on up there? All I can do is look at the Bible and see some, something. Apparently, Daniel was praying something. He didn't get an answer. Maybe he was bummed out for a little while because when, when Gabriel, whoever it was, came down and explained to him what happened, he didn't have to explain to him. Maybe Daniel was getting a little frustrated. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe it felt like brass, like nobody was listening to him. Does that mean the devil's more powerful than God? No. I mean, God allows certain things to take place because he allowed him to be the God of this world. And that's including the atmosphere. And that goes all the way up. Just in the third heaven. It's a long way up. No matter how far we can go with them little Mars things or whatever kind of things we got, we ain't never hitting the edge. Sorry, Charlie. So we see here the, the importance now of the armor we understand our enemy is really not flesh and blood. So when we look at Obama, anyway, amen. When we look at him, we know that there's somebody behind him. Now, unless he has no soul, if he was created in the pits of hell or something, and he's some kind of a monster, you know, that kind of thing. But as far as I know, he's got blood, he's got a soul, his wife, his children, all those in charge of our country have a soul. They're being manipulated by the powers that be. They don't know it. They don't recognize it because they haven't been born again. They have no idea about their, their relationship with the position of Christ. They think they're doing right. We look at them. We realize that they're the enemy to what we have here in America. We realize they're also the enemy to the cause of Christ. But every sinner that's lost is an enemy to the cause of Christ. That's potential because their daddy's the devil. So we must pray for them in authority. Paul says to do that. So when we're looking at this and we're reading this, it is true. It is real. So the Bible has to somehow check us when we think these things through. If we don't allow the Bible to check us like in a hockey game, to shake us up and say, wait a minute, stay focused now. We're not talking about them coming in, kicking your door, trying to kill your kids and everything. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about what's going on right now in our country. Verse 13. Wherefore take ye, or I'm sorry, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stand. Just to stand. Just to stand. A whole lot of me standing now. They're dropping like flies. Because there's no conviction. They have preferences, even those that own those gun co companies. Preferences. They looked at their money. They're seeing it's going to be affected, the stocks and everything. So whoever's on their stock and their, their board of directors are saying, sell, sell now. Bushmaster company. Bye-bye. You know, cheaper than dirt. Probably, bye-bye. Anything else, is, whoever's pressuring this thing, 
They're looking at their money, right? I'm losing. I'm going to lose dividends. I'm going to lose this. I'm gonna, we, better, we better do something now. Before it's too late, we won't have nothing. See, that's preferences. That's greed. That's not patriotism. A lot of those people got in, in that just for the money. But your main companies that stay will stay because a family started that. And they were patriots. I just wish people would understand that this is not heaven. Heaven's to come. And that there's no way you can stop random violence like that. There's no way at all. There's no way. Listen to me, people. Read my lips. There is no way to stop a random act of terror like that. But there is a way to prepare if it happens. And instead of losing many lives, you could maybe lose one or two or maybe none. But rather than prepare for that, they'll take everything away. See, I worked that real nice and sweet into our body, soul, and spirit lesson. I mean, it's spiritual. This is a church. have to do it like that sometimes. I mean, think about that. Powers that be, prince and power. I mean, why would the devil want to destroy America? I mean, after all, why? Maybe missionaries. Maybe love of Israel. I mean, this administration is doing everything against Israel. Give the enemy tools to annihilate them right now. But Americans refuse to believe that because their America and their heart would never do that. See, they would never do that because they're trusted in man. When you start trusting in men, you got a problem. You trust in God. And people that trust in God, they'll take that conviction to whether they're a senator, representative, whether they're a policeman, whatever. They have that in them. And that's what makes America great and good. And that's what they're trying to eliminate. Verse 14. Once again, stand. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, above all. Well, you know, the priority is so when and all this. It says above all, taking the shield of faith. Why? Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Because if you don't have that, there ain't no soul winning about it. There ain't no more living for God. You've fallen because the devil and all his little doubts, his little daggers has brought you down. You're no good. So above all, you need faith. When, you're, when your salvation's attacked in your brain, think of the verses. Go to them. Tell the devil, go back to hell or wherever he's got to go. Say, God said this. I believe it. Period. He did the work. He placed me in heavenly places. He sealed me, not myself. It's his business, not yours, devil. That's your position. You get strong in that position. You can't rock that then. Then there's other verses that come into play. The prayer verses. You need to start applying that. I believe God hears my prayer. And so on and so forth. And then 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? Word of God. Then look what it says. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for who? All saints. All saints. So our course of warfare is spiritual. No matter what we try to think or believe, it's spiritual. Every time you get a victory, it's a spiritual victory. It's not yours. All of a sudden, you're going to go and get get fit with a trainer, and you got a million dollars, and they're going to you know do all this stuff because you're going to find out as a Christian that pride gets up there, you're going to fall. But if you ask God for power, He'll give you that internal fortitude to do it. And when you're done, whatever it is, losing weight, quitting smoking. Whatever you're doing, whatever it is, the victory that's accomplished is because of God. You just keep that in your head. Why? He gets the glory. And then he gives you more. 
When you take his glory, you lose as a Christian. And if he allows you to take his glory, that's scary. And nothing happens for a while. Because you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. So listen to me. The enemy can only appeal to us through our old nature. Period. And when we get the board up, which we will one, in the, probably 2013, we'll go through all those little bullseyes I had, and we'll start thinking about the ear gate, the eye gate, you know, the senses there, the different, different gates that allow access. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I guess that's why I like that song every now and then. I want to sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of, you know. Because whoever wrote that must have uh, really thought about it. Because <laughs> you hear the same stuff over and over again. Being in the church for 30, 40, 50, 80 years, man, you hear the same stuff over and over and over again. Not supposed to be drudgery. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, a sinning saint was turned over to Satan. How about that? Now he's saved, but subject to divine chastening. Yes, he is. And in verse 5, look what it says. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. It says, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? That means what it says. Somehow with that verse, it's, it sort of like looks like the local church is like a protection. And people ain't getting this. They willfully leave the church. They willfully put their self outside of that protection. Why? Because I, I God ordained that church. That's why he said pastors, teachers, evangelists. To do what? Perfecting of the saints. That's why when you see them leave, they're good for a little while. And they start waning and this and this starts happening to them. And when they get out, their pride gets a hold of them. They don't want to admit that they made a mistake. They did it to themselves. But here it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an order. If you were to find out that somebody was doing blatant sin in the church, guess what? You're supposed to called church discipline. Well, that's cruel and, you know, grace and you're either a Bible believer or you're not. The problem is there's churches out there that will snatch them up right away when they go crying and stuff. Instead of the pastor saying, well, why aren't you over at Brother Bob's church? You know, then I run the game. Instead of him calling me, they just take him. So, I mean, how can you fulfill this? How's this person getting chastened? His sin is being complimented. See, God designed that thing so when the person's out there long enough, under his chastening hand, he will repent. And when he repent, he can come back. He's received. You'll, you'll find that out in 2 Corinthians. They receive him. But I showed you that to show you that there is a devil, and the guy is saved, and God gave him over to the devil. That's all I'm telling you. And now that devil, that devil is not going to mess with his new man. Can't. But that old man, who knows, right? Okay. Another one. Go. You're in 1 Corinthians. Go to chapter 11. This is where everybody gets judgmental, amen? Or they get under conviction and think the preacher's telling them something. Tony handled my light work years ago. That's why he's not on Facebook anymore, man. Let's see. Hallelujah. Your preacher's getting off pretty soon, a whole lot of them, because I believe I'm endangering a whole lot of people <laughs> with my stand on some things. <sighs> not biblical, but, you know, getting in all of the general area of life. First Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> How about we start... Uh, We'll just start reading in verse 30. It should be familiar. The Bible says, For this cause, many are weak 
and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Do you get that? What does it mean? What it says. Every preacher, just about every meeting that we have, including this last one, I think it was 10 or something, saying keep close, keep everything close to the Lord, you know. You know, keep your checkbook balanced. You mess up, tell them you're sorry. Don't let things add up. If you let them add up, that's when you got a problem because then you'll start to forget. Like a liar, right? You start lying a little bit and then you got to lie something else to cover up that lie and that lie. Then when you get right, you don't know what to get right with because you don't know how many things you lied about. That's the way we are. Humans. When you get started to do wrong, it's like it starts snowballing. And then it gets out of control. So, sinning saints at Corinth also were subject to weakness, sickness, and death. And, you know, and that death being prematured. They had this uh, happen to them as a reminder they belonged to God, according to verse 32. Now, there are many that have been sick, including you and I. And this does not mean it's God's chastening all the time. Every individual, born-again believer knows what he or she is up to in secret. I mean, if things are manifested to the church, then church discipline is imposed. But like everything else that has to do with the flesh, it takes time to happen. We need to take heed, heed to the warnings of God and avoid the habit of not staying right. Your illness and death could be caused For God's glory also. Now this knowledge is needed today. You say why? Well, when so many think it's their duty to prove that they can sin because of their liberty and His grace will not uh, chasten them. I mean, good night. That's crazy theology. But that's just me saying it. And they'll say this. I'm not not saying it like that. Yeah, you are. Somebody says you've been saved all this time. What are you doing drinking a beer in that? Don't judge me. Judge not lest you, you know all that stuff. And you just want to you want to you want to get in the flesh and just punch them. Say you are an idiot. You know. And just look at them and say what what is this? You go to church. Yeah, our church teaches liberty and grace. We love you. We love people. We're not mean spirited. You know. You hear all that. Pretty soon you start getting a complex unless you get in this book. Well, they are running man twenty five thousand people. You know, or they are running a thousand even. Five hundred, two hundred. Anyway, you start saying, well, maybe I'm not doing everything right. No kidding, Sherlock. But I know what I am doing right, and that's this book. The best of my knowledge. And when I see them make excuses for that, that they just shows me number one, they didn't really get saved. Or number two, they're so full of their self, man, there's something wrong with them. Bad. And it's gonna and it's gonna be bad. And I've been here now, what, almost 20 years, and I've saw their families, and I saw what happened to their families. And when I get around them, they sort of put their head down, don't want to say them because they're afraid I'm going to ask them, how's your family? Or they get on the defensive right away. Whoa, calm down. For somebody to read this book, the Pauline Epistles, and not come to the conclusion that you should be in a house of God where the Word of God is not only preached, but it's believed as the Word of God, and have a, a pastor over you, there's something wrong with you. Period. There's just so much protection. You don't have to be smart. You can drag yourself in here with all sorts of things you need victory over. But just you being faithful, God will start to give you stuff you never never could dream of. Give you power and jobs. And just bless you. Just by hanging in. People need a good dose to go to rescue mission or something. See how that works. People in Jimmy Hood's church, some of them really make it. And they make it because they stay under them no matter what. God give them just enough power to stay off crack, just enough power to stay off heroin, just enough. Next thing you know, they get married. 
And you can tell their life because they still haven't, haven't gotten all that stuff like we got all spick and span, you know. But you see, they're happy. They come in there. It's just an enjoyable. You see their kids all looking like uh, um, Oliver Twist. <laughs> <laughs> like one of them old movies, you know, they come in like the chimney cleaners and how everybody's always dirty and everything. And you're sitting there watching them and their smiles are like this big. And the little kids are happy because daddy ain't beating on mama or mama ain't beating on daddy and, and the grace of God. Now that's it. Now you go talk to them about what they have liberty to do. They're blunt. When they'll, they'll flat out tell you you're stupid and probably even use vulgarity. Still growing. So if you, if you get my gist in the teaching the last few weeks, your teenagers need to know this. You as adults, what I read right there is pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory, right? I mean, if you go over those verses again, just see how simple they are. You can stop and break them up. Are you in God? Are you saved? Okay, then, boom, this is, this is the power you got, you know? And let God work with them and their mind and their growth level. But there's a body, soul, and spirit because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, and they're all in creation. Anything created was created by them. So if God is a trinity and the creator of all things, then everything in the creation would bear the imprint of triunity upon examination. And it does. Like I said, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit starts it. You have man. Man has a soul, a body, a spirit, right? He's a person. He has nature and personality. And it's neat because all these things fall under God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, but we ain't got time to do the type thing. And, uh, okay, so you have a childhood, manhood, maturity. Under a family, you have a man, woman, child. Problems, you have mental, emotional, and physical. In reality, you have space, matter, and time. In space, you have length, width, and depth. In time, you have past, present, and future. In matter, you have source, generation, and procession. You have liquid, solid, and gas. In the military, you have Navy, Army, and Air Force. I don't know why I don't have Marine there. I just bumped it because they're part of it. In kingdoms, <laughs> sorry, Chef. In kingdoms, you have animal, vegetable, and mineral. Continents. You have Asia, Europe, and Africa. The Americas, you have North, Central, and South. Education, you have grammar, middle, and high. You have junior college, college, and postgraduate. Location, you have land, sea, and air. In astronomy, you have sun, moon, and stars. Answers, you have yes, no, and maybe. In the atmosphere, you have ionosphere, stratosphere, and exosphere. In the height, you have top, middle, and bottom. Weight, you have light, medium, and heavy. In music, you have harmony, rhythm, and melody. In musical note, you have pitch, volume, and duration. In art, you have perspective, uh, composition, and form. In color, you have chrome, U, and value. In history, you have ancient, medieval, and modern. In religions, you have Hinduism, Mohammedism, and Buddhism. Catholicism, Protestantism, and Greek Orthodox. You see how those three ancients go up on top and the other ones go on the bottom. But there's three on each section there. In offices, you have bishops, elders, and deacons. In the races, you have Caucasian, Negroid, and Oriental. Or Japheth, Ham, and Shem. Bible languages, you have Hebrew, Syriac, which is also Aramaic, and Greek. Bible writers, you have fathers, prophets, apostles. Old Testament, you have law the prophets, and the writings, which are Psalms. In the New Testament, you have Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles. In systems, you have Catholicism, Communism, Capitalism, historical, spiritual, and doctrinal. In conditions, you have lost, saved, Savior, hell, earth, heaven. Then you have, on the Mount of Transfiguration, you got Peter, James, and John. You have Christ, Elijah, and Moses. In logic, you have major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. Electricity of positive, negative, and neutral. This is breaking things down to the threes. You'll have subpoints. You have everything go. That everybody say, "I want about this." Order. They come down to three. Okay, just like your 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 uh, uh, any kind of equation, anything. Uh, that's the first thing I found out because I don't know much about math, but I caught on to that real quick. That I had a whole lot of problems. I always had two of something. 
I just missed one stupid thing. You know, and when I found that, that X, it's taken me forever to get that. 62 years old. It's an alphabet, man. What's wrong with them people? But I'm catching on now what that means.